And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then follows a fascinating two verses. There appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And he, being in agony, prayed the longer. And his sweat became as drops of blood, trickling down upon the ground. Many modern editions of scripture, such as the Revised Standard Version, which is widely used by Catholics, omits this verse. This has become some, some important manuscripts do not contain these verses, nor do some Alexandrian church fathers mention it. And there are stylistic anomalies as well. However, these verses are included in some Western manuscripts, and some Western church fathers and Byzantine church fathers use these verses. And perhaps more influentially, they're included in the Latin Vulgate. And therefore, they entered into Roman Catholic tradition as affirmed by the Council of Trent. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his Catina Aurea commentary on these verses in Luke, quotes Bede, the Venerable, and St. Augustine of Hippo as follows. Bede says, Let no one ascribe to Christ's sweat natural weakness. That is, to say that it's contrary because, well, one can't sweat blood. But rather, let him derive therefrom a declaration that Christ was now attaining the accomplishment of his prayer, namely, that he might purge by his blood the faith of the disciples who were still con convicted of human frailty. And St. Augustine says this, Our Lord pr praying with a bloody sweat represented the martyrdoms which should come from his whole body, which is the church. The scene of Christ in Gethsemane, racked with pain and praying to his father, was beautifully rendered by Fra Angelico, who shows the three sleeping disciples in the foreground, and an angel bringing Christ the chalice in the background. El Greco has a similar construction. With Christ then in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find the paradoxes of divine strength matched with human weakness, trust in the Father's will, united with foreknowledge of impending doom, surrender to one's circumstances, and fear of what pain may come. With this framing in mind, we may fruitfully address a virtue which goes to the heart of the issue, namely the virtue of fortitude and the skill of resilience. Aquinas will be our guide in the basic definitions and theological dimensions of fortitude. And Craig Stephen Titus, with his unsurpassed work, Resilience and the Virtue of Fortitude, Aquinas in Dialogue with Psychological Sciences, he will show us the way to integrate to mystic understandings of fortitude with neuroscience and biological psychology, and we'll use some other resources along the way. Let's begin by noticing that higher animals, including humans, dogs, apes, dolphins, and others, have two basic movements in what Aquinas calls their appetites. Sometimes we perceive an object as good, safe, and delightful. These qualities call forth what he would call our desiring or concupiscible appetite. It's looking for a sensory delight. Other times we perceive an object as good insofar as it's a means by which we can then achieve this other good that the concupiscible appetite desires. These more difficult goods, the ones that are means, they call forth our irascible or aggressive appetite and it's looking for the difficult good. Neuroscientist Stephen Porges gives an account of what he calls neuroception, and he helps us to see that we have some reactions that operate even without our rational deliberation. They are quasi-intuitional responses. They are reactions to our instincts or our training. His account, Porges's, agrees with Aquinas and other psychologists such as John Bowlby they help us to see that there are four basic qualities or intentions that we estimate based on clues that we pick up even without thinking about it. As we see the rapid approach of a thing, 
the height of an object, its shape, and some of its other qualities. We see four, one of four qualities, either that it is a conquerable danger, that it's an escapable danger, that it is an inescapable danger, or that it's an approachable good. One of these intentions, once it hits us, then the motion called arousal occurs, whereby, well, we react to the thing emotionally and then behaviorally. Arousal compared to stasis may be compared to the difference between being fully awake versus being partly asleep. We have increased physical energy, increased mental activity, and we move ourselves in relation to the thing that we've just perceived, whether it's dangerous or safe. On a positive side, we can say that arousal helps us to have a survival advantage so that we are better prepared for whatever may come. On the negative side, sometimes arousal can overwhelm us or we can be too influenced by our reaction. Now, there are four basic reactions which correspond to these estimations we make, and they are fight, flight, freeze, and befriend. Let's give an example. Let's suppose that um, there is a small toddler and he sees a dog coming at him. Well, the first kind of um, thing that the toddler can perceive is that, well, it's a small dog. And so his behavioral response might be to fight the dog if he thinks this dog is dangerous. Maybe you'll see the toddler give a whack to the dog's head. Or perhaps he sees that this dog is coming, but it is an escapable danger. And so the toddler might engage in flight from that danger. Or he might flee in the presence toward some parental figure who can then give him safety. Or perhaps when the toddler sees this dog coming along, the toddler thinks that he can't escape it. Maybe he's in the corner. The dog is coming toward him. There's nowhere to go. And so then the toddler might freeze. He has immobility. He, he, his limbs might lock up. And so he may hide or stop moving entirely. And then finally, perhaps the dog is approaching and the toddler perceives that the dog looks friendly. And so the toddler then befriends it. He reaches out to pet the puppy and he enjoys that little furry creature. So we can have fight, flight, freeze, or befriend. And all of these happen without our deliberative knowledge. It happens as it were quasi instinctually and our human brain is operating but we're not rationally making a syllogism in order to understand what is going on. This happens both, as I said, for toddlers, dogs, dolphins, well, and for us too. The proper role of the virtue of fortitude is to preserve the will in the good of reason against the greatest evil. Once we perceive something as dangerous, whether it's conquerable or escapable or inescapable, we need the virtue of fortitude now to help our mind to then control our passionate reaction as we are aroused in response to this dangerous object that's coming toward us. Philosophical analysis and neuroscientific explanations helped help us to understand how fortitude responds to fear. Neurological studies suggest that the amygdala is central to feelings of fear but really no portion of the body is solely dedicated to feelings of fear. Fear involves brain activity in response to the perceived threat, it makes the heart pound, the palms sweat, perhaps it boosts adrenaline, it engages the nervous system. It can start to make people's knees knock, it can make their knees lock up. When a deer comes across bright lights in the middle of the night, as the car comes toward it, the deer freezes. Its whole body is engaged by this fear and now frozen immobile, unable to act until something else happens. Fear may thus be distinguished from other kinds of behaviors in response to a stimulus. For example, being startled. That's a kind of immediate avoidance toward a present but slight evil. The door slams too hard, you're startled. You don't fear the door, but it surprises you. Or perhaps there's dread, which could mean despairing of an overcoming and impending severe evil as perhaps we can think of in the Lord of the Rings, the hobbits, as they heard the Nazgul fly over, they dreaded the approach of these wicked creatures. Now fear, especially the fear of death, 
combined with a desire for self-preservation tends to make a person flee difficult goods. One's imagination is engaged in fear. For fear, Thomas Aquinas says, may be defined as a pain or disturbance due to imagining some destructive or painful evil in the future or one that's closer at hand. Memory involves our fear as well, because, well, as a fear factor, memory affects those who have suffered, those who remember evils that they've survived, and often fear that something similar will happen in the future. So reason, of course, does not always play a role in one's fears, because one's fears might be baseless, irrational, exaggerated, or perhaps just disengaged from good judgment. When fear begins to rule a person's life, pathologies and various phobias may be at work. Perhaps you fear spiders, as Tolkien did. Or perhaps you fear clowns, or I had a friend who feared dolls. <laughs> Explain that one. When faced with daily dangers to one's own vulnerability, a person needs to have this habitual interior strength to combat these evils or to endure them in a reasonable way, in a reasonable time, and toward a reasonable goal. He needs the virtue of fortitude. So what we see then is that clinical applications, perhaps, of Porges's polyvagal theory, this intuitional response to these objects, it appears promising. Porges suggests that we ought to have some kind of response interiorly. We breathe, we relax our muscles. We try to allow our vagus nerve, which runs from our brainstem all the way down to our heart and it affects our guts, try to relax that in such a way that we're no longer strung up as it were, but we're loose and calm in response to this potential evil. You know, it's funny because even fighters know, uh, boxers learn, for instance, that the best way to fight is not by being overly wound up, but to have this sort of medium level of arousal, where they're not so, say, depressed and sluggish, they have no energy, but if you have too much energy and you're too wound up, well, then you might just swing and miss all the time. And this is the case for all, well, skills that you want to learn using your body, playing the piano. You can't have so much fear that your hands shake when you're trying to play, but you can't be so relaxed that you just sort of plunk along and no longer are playing the proper tune. What you need is just enough energy, just enough, a little bit of fear to give you energy so then you can go and play a perfect piece. So on, on the natural level, then there's some ways in which we can try to inhibit those first reactions of fear. But of course, that's not enough because fear is more than this intuitional response. For adults whose minds are awake and responding, fear involves our reason. And it often involves a judgment about the thing in relation to us. So if we consider the deeper roots of fear, Aquinas shows us that one of the foundations of all fear is that it's based on love for some good. We fear the loss of a good, or we fear the hurt, the wound, the vulnerability of some good. When you love something, you love it because it's good, and so perhaps then you fear losing it. And also, well, fear also involves the lack of control. We do not fear what we're able to control. Whatever's within our power and within our will to move according to our intended end, we don't fear that. I don't fear the puppy if it comes along because I can pick it up. And even if it's you know, swinging its little legs, well, that's not going to bother me. But if there's a bear, as I once encountered in the woods, that gives you a bit of a fright because you can't control that bear. And so we, uh, Aquinas also says, we don't fear sin so much as we fear temptation, because sin is involved in a choice, whereas temptation can lead you to the choice. And so temptation actually is the thing we ought to fear. Although, of course, we fear the evil of sin, temptation is what leads us there. And so in, in a way, it calls our fear more presently. We need to evaluate fear, therefore, in light of reason and in light of faith, and not just sort of experience its waves as it comes upon us and engages our emotional system. Instead, we need to think about the nature of the object, the nature of our situation, and then we also have to think about how God is involved. So for instance, when we think about fear in light of reason, we can consider our, our natural well-being, 
and dangers posed to it in light of these various objects. Is this thing really going to kill me? Is this thing really going to harm my health? Or am I just, you know, afraid because of propaganda, because what other people have said? Think about fear in light of faith, dangers to your eternal salvation. Those are the things to fear. Our Lord says, fear not him who can kill the body but cannot touch the soul. Fear him who can put the soul into everlasting fire in Gehenna. And then we also have to consider fear in, the, in light of the fact that it can be ordinate or disordinate. In other words, fear can be well-ordered. It can be reasonable to fear some things. Some evils need to be shunned. Others need to be combated. Others need not be feared when they're within our power. However, there can be a reasonable fear. For example, we realistically fear what truly poses a clear threat to some meaningful good. Once I served as a chaplain in a um, prison, a super maximum security prison. These are the fellows who are in the maximum security and did bad stuff, and they were sent to the super maximum security. And when I told my mother what I was doing, she feared for me. My baby, she said over the phone. Well, maybe that's realistic. Reasonable fear motivates us to seek counsel and support. In this case, making sure that I followed all the proper rules in order to walk through that prison safely with the guy who had a rifle drawn. Reasonable fear does not gravely disturb our thinking. We must be aware of what can unravel our reason. And that's why, well, one must be wary of fear, but aware of it as well. Sometimes fear can drive us to perform acts that are contrary to our eternal good. Perhaps in fear for losing money or in fear of losing a friendship, a person might end up compromising himself and thereby lose God's friendship. And so this is where we need also the gift of fortitude. The gift of fortitude from the Holy Spirit helps us and in fact impels us to withstand even to the point of death, whatever attacks our faith. You see, the real loss is spiritual life. And if, if our faith is lost, then the principle of our spiritual life is lost. And therefore, we should be afraid of submitting our faith to some false idea. Not overly fearful, but wary that these may pose dangers to ourselves. There's a book called How to Make an Atheist. I wouldn't recommend that book for most people. However, I teach a class on faith and vices contrary to faith. And that book, well, comes in useful. And so the gift of fortitude then can help us to withstand, even to the point of death, whatever attacks our faith. We call upon the Holy Spirit. Reasonable fear, therefore, heightens our attention, our reflection, and our carefulness. Now, I've tried to lay out very briefly how these principles in their broadest and most general extent can be valuable and how they relate to our life in various small examples. What I want to do now is go more deeply into their psychological manifestations. And to do so, I'm going to take a page from the neuroevolutionary work of Yak Pensep and other ethological phenomenology. So that way, I can offer three models of how animals and people respond to a threatening environment with fear or courage. And these models, of course, are, well, I mean, I'm sure uh, a biologist may criticize them for being a little overly simplistic, but for our purposes, they provide, again, a phenomenological description of different kinds of people in relation to fear, courage, or we're going to see softness. And so there are three kinds of creatures that I'm going to discuss. Some have exoskeletons. Others are worms, the vermes class. And the third are those with endoskeletons. And each of these can be considered as a sort of psychological type with respect to courage and what Aquinas calls the vices contrary to courage or fortitude. So let's begin with exoskeletons. An exoskeleton kind of person is hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. Insects such as ants, Animals such as hermit crabs, mollusks such as oysters, they have their skeletons on the outside. And they're kind of like an armor of a medieval knight. 
exoskeletons provide protection. Their hard casing constitutes an impermeable barrier, a shell that protects their organs inside. Even a thin shell can protect uh, the inside and shield it from dangers, keep the inside of the animal um, free from, say, scratches. And so it takes a relatively large amount of pressure in order to crack that shell. And some people are like this too. In society, they give a hard front. The person seems perhaps gruff, distant, emotionless, or perhaps shy, and, and they shy away from any kind of confrontation. This person has the advantage, of course, of, well, his, his way of responding to dangers that protects him from emotional drama and trauma. And it's helpful, of course, especially if he's been uh, wounded in the past or if he feels vulnerable. Exoskeletons are simple. The fact is that there's no need to create a complex relationship with the environment. When the water washes over the, the, um, the oyster, the oyster, it doesn't matter whatsoever if the water is coming hard or soft, if the water is coming fast or slow, the oyster remains because it's quite a tough shell. And so it stops all environmental factors from entering inside so the organs can perform their function and build that little pearl. And human beings who have this kind of relationship to the world, hard on the outside, instead of learning how to deal with the complex environments in which they live, and instead of trying to navigate different social spheres, well, they have a simple, repeatable approach to life. And here we might think in a positive sense of, say, um, contemplative nuns or monks. They have a natural exoskeleton because they can retreat back to their house, the soft interior of the contemplative life. And then when they go outside, well, they just have this sort of protection because, you know, nuns, for instance, they have the grill and nothing comes inside that grill. No one goes into the cloister. They're protected. And so it provides a hard shell for their way of life. But then notice that there's some costs to the exoskeleton way of life. They're limited in, in mobility, limited in size. Oysters cannot grow too large. Exoskeletons don't grow. Rather, what they do is they accrete. They add bit by bit onto themselves. You know, there's some mollusks that have to crawl out of their shell, be very vulnerable, and then find another shell in the meanwhile. And so what this means is that typically they have to remain fairly small because the weight of the exoskeleton does not scale up very well. And perhaps this helps us to understand why Teresa of Avila said that a Carmelite monastery ought to have 12 sisters, ideally. It's a small environment in which the outside can be kept away, so the inside can have the soft interior life devoted to Christ. But what this means, though, is that they can be quite vulnerable when they leave their exoskeleton, as it were. When a nun leaves the cloister, perhaps, you know, to see a doctor, or when a monk finds himself having to travel, then he's struck by all the lights and the chaos of the city. And think about a person emotionally who perhaps puts off a, a gruff front in front of others. He goes to the party and, you know, speaks badly and speaks harshly and so on. And perhaps he doesn't know how to engage these dangers that he experiences. Or think of a, a, a knight when he's in his strong metal armor. He encounters another knight, well, they're equally hampered by the movements of their armor. But if, say, a bear comes to chase him, he can't run away very fast. Quite different from uh, a different kind of vulnerability than the ones we'll talk about later. Here, the vulnerability is of lack of flexibility, lack of ability to change your way of relating to the world. And so these people are less adaptable and often, well, less enjoyable. Furthermore, we can say a cost of the exoskeleton kind of fortitude is that it provides protection against fairly minor dangers, but it also limits sensitivity. The oyster does not have great senses with respect to its environment. Only when it's open and entirely vulnerable can it then, as it were, test the temperature, the salinity of the water, and can feel pressure against its inside. But when it's closed up, it has almost no relation to the outside whatsoever. Simplicity then prevents a greater development of a complex relationship with the exterior world. 
And likewise, people who put off this kind of front, well, what that means is often they're perhaps less sensitive to emotional situations. Maybe they have difficulties showing empathy, or perhaps they can be one-sided in their relationship with others. Often this perhaps means that people dismiss them, just as you could walk right on top of the shells of an oyster and not fear cracking it. And so he might miss out on the depths of others because he's not vulnerable toward them. Now we'll go to the opposite end of the scale. If we've looked at oysters and the exoskeleton relationship psychologically to dangers that come along, well, let's look at the people who are on the opposite end, namely these people who have, well, no skeleton at all. In Linnaeus's classification system, he called these vermes. They're soft all the way through. And vermes, of course, means worm, but it includes jellyfish, slugs, earthworms, tapeworms, and this sort. I want to talk about the jellyfish. I think they're beautiful when you see them dancing in the aquarium and the lights on them. A jellyfish is boneless. The main feature of a true jellyfish is its umbrella-like shaped bell. It has little tentacles that, that fall down from this hollow structure. And so it's a mass of transparent jelly-like matter that contains collagen, which is related to skin and other fibrous proteins. On the outside of the bell, there's this stalk-like structure hanging down from the center, and it's the mouth. It also functions as the anus. Jellyfish have limited control over their movement. They can navigate the pulsations of the water simply by squeezing the water out and then allowing the water to fill their bell back again. But if you have strong waves, the, belly, the jellyfish must move with those waves because they can't swim against the current. And so jellyfish then typically don't have special systems for, well, respiration, circulation. They don't need a respiratory system because there's a su sufficient amount of oxygen in the water that goes through their epidermis. Jellyfish are brainless. A loose network of nerves called a neural net surrounds the epidermis. Although traditionally thought to have a, a nervous system, central nervous system, rather they have ganglion-like structures that could be considered, well, the most primitive of among the species. So what are benefits to the jellyfish? Well, the fact is, is that it needs little effort to get by. The jellyfish can move with the water and whatever comes along, it accepts. I would compare the jellyfish to what Aquinas calls the soft person. And this is quite common in our time. He says that the vice of softness is equivalent to uh, acedia or sloth in a general sense. He says, quote, insofar as softness shuns spiritual good as toilsome or troublesome to the body or as a hindrance to your pleasures. He says, therefore, it's this kind of sloth because a man seeks bodily comfort and pleasure instead of the difficulties of the spiritual life. In itself, the vice of softness inordinately shuns all things that are weary to it because it wants to escape those things. A thing is said to be soft, he said, if it readily yields to touch. Properly speaking, a soft person is one who withdraws from the good because it causes some kind of sorrow and difficulty and always yields to pleasure because it's weak. And so when pleasures are lacking or seem to be lacking, the soft person moves away from even the good thing that he knows. And he's like the jellyfish, soft. The jellyfish has no ability to defend itself except by poison. And what does the soft person typically do? Poisons with their language, with their tongue. Just as the jellyfish reaches its tentacles down into the water and tries to capture something within its poisonous reach, so likewise, a soft person can't defend themselves with their sort of gruff exterior like the exoskeleton. Rather, what they do is they, they say bad things about people. They gossip, they complain, they whine, and this becomes their primary way of dealing with problems that they encounter. An advantage, perhaps, of um, the jellyfish, the soft kind of creature, is that there's high survival rate in the herd. Individuals, well, they might pass away very easily, but when you have 100,000 jellyfish, at least one of them will survive, even when a giant whale comes and eats some of them. And likewise, I would say, well, 
Lots of soft people produced by technology, produced by modern comforts, lack of real work and effort. Well, maybe one or two might fall away and people don't even notice. How many people are struck down by vices which relate to softness, not being able to encounter the difficulties of life, instead turning to video games or drugs, alcohol, these kinds of pleasures. So we can see then that without the virtue of fortitude, the person who is psychologically soft is going to turn away from fortitude and toward intemperance. That's almost a natural movement. And so just like the jellyfish, well, how many, how many people do we have now who die every year from drug overdoses? Far more than some of the major diseases. And we can say that's unfortunately softness brought to its highest conclusion. Psychologically, the costs of softness are related to the jellyfish. It has no complexity. Think about how simple the jellyfish is, even compared to the oyster. The oyster can develop a beautiful pearl within it by continually secreting a little bit of chemicals that will turn a grain of sand into a wonderful jewel. Jellyfishes can't do that. They're so simple, they're so uncomplex, their mind has nothing to think, nothing to say. And this, we might say, is uh, the soft person taken to the final conclusion. There used to be an insult calling people soft in the head. And what that meant was that they had no intellectual engagement with the world. They were solely interested in pleasure and survival. Notice the jellyfish too is heartless. Many soft people, they have no deep emotional engagement with the environment. They're perhaps uninterested in the arts, music, classical dance. They're numbed to beauty and they numb other things with their poison. They're boneless. <laughs> There's no interior sense of strength. They have no mouth, no guts, and no reproductive system, just like the jellyfish. And notice then that the only protection that they have is the herd and poisoning or stinging predators. And um, people often say that millennials or Generation Z, with apologies, I think I fall in one of those categories, that they have, well, difficult to control emotions. They're easily triggered. They live in a virtual herd on Instagram, Snapchat, less on Twitter, that's more for Generation X. They wound people easily and are wounded easily. They spread their poison and they often forget what the good is. And that's because they're only semi-conscious. So what are the causes of softness, according to Aquinas? He says it's custom from what they've done over and over again. You become habituated, certain kinds of pleasures, become addicted to them. He says some people have a natural disposition. If some people have a gruff exterior as their natural uh, disposition, he calls those cholerics, well, others have a soft disposition. They're just kinder and gentler, but that means sometimes they don't push themselves hard enough. And he says, finally, excessive play. And I'll just leave it there. And then finally, we come to the third category. And as you can imagine, this, of course, is the best. And these are the creatures with endoskeletons. They're soft on the outside, but they're crunchy on the inside. <laughs> and this means that they have skeletons inside. And these are mammals. And particularly, humans have important endoskeletons. So let's think about this once again. Endoskeletal creatures they lack a hard shell, but instead they have hard bones surrounded by muscles. They have organs and skin, and what this allows them to do is have greater movement, and therefore they have a smoother and greater variety of movements. Instead of the clickety-click-click of the crab as it stumbles along, human beings can walk, dance, glide. They can run and jump, and they can do all sorts of behaviors because their muscles having this smooth exterior relationship to the hard interior bone structure allows them to stretch and contract and to have a variety of movements. And we can then imagine that what does this mean psychologically? People who have a strong core of their inner values, who are connected to Christ, those who know what their faith is, that's, that's their skeletal structure. And sometimes it's hidden. We don't know if somebody has faith necessarily. Maybe they're not wearing a what would Jesus do t-shirt. But inside, they have this sense of being that strengthens them against other dangers. And so this allows them greater movement because then their muscles, the virtues and the skills that they add to their faith, 
Well, this gives them a way to relate to their environment. They can avoid dangers in a smooth diplomatic manner. Perhaps they learn friendship in a safe environment. Because of this interior core of strength, their spine, as it were, this provides them with stability and flexibility of movement. Also notice that creatures with endoskeletons have a more complex relationship with their environment. Their semi-permeable skin allows them to, as it were, feel a wider range of sensations, temperature, pressure, pain, and they have more complex regulation of their body temperature by sweat, and they can show their interior life exteriorly through their skin. The features of your face are possible only because you have an endoskeleton. There's no expression on the face of an oyster. It doesn't even have a face. And think then about the human being in relation to fortitude. Because they have some vulnerability, but they also have some strength that gives them an intimate experience of life. They appreciate the beauties of their environment. They learn the subtle cues of social interactions. They develop more profound thoughts related to the nature of man and perhaps nature itself. And so because of this relationship, they're able to, as it were, feel and interact, speak and smile in relation to the good of nature and also to, well, combat it more effectively. They don't just crawl up into their shell and they don't just give up in this soft mass. Instead, they can take up a weapon, they can use their hands, or they can speak diplomatically to try to resolve the situation. Now we have to say, as good as endoskeletons are, of course, there will be costs as there are for everything in this natural world. They have a decreased distinction between self and environment. Precisely because your skin is permeable, if you touch something too poisonous, it can even go through your skin if the poison is powerful enough, or if you're touching something like mercury. The lack of a complete barrier means that sometimes you might be compromised by outer things, or perhaps if it's not kept in check, if your barrier is broken, it could lead to a dissolution of yourself with respect to the environment. And some people, when something dangerous comes along in their life and they don't have that interior strength, perhaps their bones start to crumble interiorly, they're no longer able to, as it were, fight off those dangers. And notice too that precisely because you have this soft skin that surrounds you, you have a decreased protection, increased pain. And this means that, of course, sometimes those who have not been able to ward off the dangers that fortitude is meant to combat or to endure, they may develop wounds and scars. Perhaps they're more easily hurt by exterior harms, and these can lead to anxiety and fear for past hurts and for future ones that might come. And so we have to say then that prudence needs to guide fortitude. Just as our prudence helps us to keep our bodies safe from these exterior dangers, so likewise prudence is going to, as it were, keep us psychologically balanced. So we know when to fight, when to flee, when to, as it were, stay still and freeze, or when to befriend. All the acts of fortitude necessarily involve some kind of suffering, because as it were, we are these endoskeletal creatures, and we're going to have to sacrifice some good in the course of pursuing a higher good, because here we can't have all goods at once. We're finite. Our hands are too small to grasp all goods at once. And so taking initiative includes sacrificing the pleasure of the status quo. And endurance means not fully enjoying whatever good is precluded by a present evil. However, to the degree that a person's health and character is excellent, he will in, in turn sense the pain embedded in courageous acts. Because a person naturally enjoys the good of life, a virtuous person finds life worth living. And so when his life is threatened, then he is especially sensitive to it. Nevertheless, the excellence of character that is afforded by virtue and strengthened by the grace of the Holy Spirit makes courage possible even when it's painful. Instead of dampening the ardor of bravery, the presence of difficulty could increase it because the courageous person chooses excellence of the soul over more mundane goods. The quasi-virtue of confidence, for example, is one's sure hope of initiating great and honorable undertakings. It prepares you to do great things for the highest ends, especially for God. 
And so we can think of those who perhaps have suffered for Christ and with Christ. Perhaps we think of the recusant English Catholics who supported the church, even though their generosity ended up making them impoverished. We can think of those martyrs who stood up against the most difficult tortures, knowing that the pain of the body was nothing compared to the love of Christ that came at the end. And so we can say then that, well, virtue is its own reward, but not always in this life. A person with advanced virtue can experience spiritual joys even while he suffers and perhaps dies from that suffering, as Christ did. The scope of fortitude extends to nearly all walks of life because one encounters obstacles to right habituation and, well, right courage at every turn. Martial courage is necessary on the battlefield. Intellectual courage is necessary in the classroom. Political courage is necessary among legislatures. And we might say familial courage is necessary for marriage. In a culture immersed in lies, one needs courage to speak the truth, especially when it's inconvenient. In a culture of death, one needs courage to support life. In a culture of irreligion, one needs courage to worship the one true God. Fortitude is necessary for all the virtues. It helps a person in his community to develop and practice good habits despite any evil whatsoever. Now, as I've said, in order to be perfect, the virtue of fortitude needs the gifts of the Holy Spirit because they help us to endure in a Christ-like way so that all fear becomes expelled from the mind and the person with the highest grace of the Holy Spirit experiences confidence even in the face of martyrdom. And this brings us back to Christ in Gethsemane. Christ is the exemplar of fortitude. Of course, as God, Christ perseveres in the good forever. God never gives up. God never backs down. God never fears anything. As St. John said, perfect love casts out fear. But as a man, Christ experienced our condition. He took flesh upon us. And so, therefore, he took upon our weaknesses as well. Those who are weak, whether by nature or by condition, have fear. And fear in this life is inescapable. Those who have known loss and suffering, those who lack support, they can experience a knocking of knees, a queasiness of stomach, lightness of the head, and perhaps near blackout when faced with difficulties and distress. And yet, when evil looms near and threatens us with unimaginable pain, we can be like Christ. He experienced the first movements of fear, as Aquinas said, but that didn't stop him from following what he knew to be God's will, which was ultimately for the good of the world. Although Jesus felt the beginnings of fear in the Garden of Gethsemane, he nevertheless suffered for the truth of the gospel. And so this truth brought him ultimately to the resurrection, whereby with the Father, he was glorified. Blessed are you, he says, when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for men persecuted the prophets who were before you. And he says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Be faithful unto death, says the Lord in Revelation, and I will give you the crown of life. Thank you, Father Ezra. That was such a fascinating, insightful look at fortitude. I know it, a lot of what you said was totally new to me. Um, we're going to now have our question and answer session. So um, if anyone has questions, please type them into the chat, and then um, I'll read them aloud. Um, while you're gathering your questions, um, I'm going to ask the obvious one. Um, this sounds great but what do I do if I'm a jellyfish on Instagram? <laughs> How is there anything, especially from the more um, developmental psychology research you looked at for how to actually grow in fortitude? Yeah, great. So, so first I would say um, knowing where we are on the scale of things from uh, exoskeleton to jellyfish, um, th that's the first, that's the first start is, okay, what are my inclinations? What are my habits that I've developed over time? And, um, and self-knowledge, of course, is the beginning of virtue, as Socrates says. So if you're on the jellyfish end of things, then, well, what you have to do is do hard things. You have to, as it were, well, sacrifice things. I, I remember one person told me that for Lent, she gave up eating chocolate every day 
That was a start. That was a start. <laughs> and so what we have to do is sometimes actually realize that the sacrifices we make will be unpleasant. And we have to kind of accept that. We have to say, I'm going to endure this little unpleasantness. And, and eventually that will, as it were, build up a, a little bit of a callus. The other thing though, so, so one is sort of practicing doing difficult things even when we don't want to do them. Uh, maintaining better order in one's life also, uh, like having a, a, a set schedule. So that's that's sort of the exterior. But then the interior is developing actually a stronger sense of faith and a stronger sense of desire to do the good for God. And once you have that interior desire, that becomes like strengthening your bones with greater spiritual calcium. So that way, then you can you can then have a motive for wanting to endure difficult things, even when, well, they're painful. And then uh, what's your advice for the oyster who's, you know, a little crusty? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the oyster has to, has to um, once again, think about, well, why, why are they like that? If a lot of jellyfish become so through habituation to pleasure, a lot of people become, as it were, you know, oyster-like because of pains they've endured. And maybe they become, you know, difficult or harsh, and they, they want to ignore the environment because uh, they have felt that they've you know, been hurt in the past. So, so there, it's actually a habituation to safe friendships, learning how to engage with people that um, provide a safe environment where they can be themselves, they can talk and they can laugh, they can share their thoughts, and that's going to help them then to break down unnecessary and artificial barriers to their interaction with others. Well, at the same time, it can show them that not all things are as dangerous as they seem. Because if you think about it, the person who has the hard exterior, um, in a certain way, they're responding by too great a fear. It's fear in excess, which is why they're so hard. Whereas the jellyfish, in a way, they don't fear enough because they think, oh, this won't bother me. This won't harm me. I won't go to hell if I do this once, will I? And so you can see how, in a certain respect, one is too fearful, even though it doesn't seem like it. And the other is too fearless, even though it doesn't seem like it. Okay. Um, and I think it seems like what's behind a lot of this is also issues with temperance, uh, like how the two of them interact. Does that seem to make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so as, as, a, as I pointed out, when Aquinas discussed softness, and he said that a person becomes soft through one, one way is through excessive play. And, and for Aquinas, it's really important because play is actually, it can be a virtue. He calls it eutropalia. He says it's good to have fun, to joke around. It's, um, it's good to relax. He says you can't keep the bow always bent. You have to relax it. So, so play can be a virtue. But I think in modern times, um, it often goes to excess. And there's this kind of intemperance with respect to um, fun, pleasurable things. And, you know, I mean, that's the design of most of our media devices is to sort of make you intemperate. So going on a media um, fast or detox or helping you yourself to limit your uses of that will help to develop that better sense of temperance in general. Gotcha. Um, but that's something specifically different from a lot of the um, kind of fortitude issues we're talking about, right? Yes and no, because when you give up a pleasure, then you have to endure that the itching for the thing. And so you need a kind of a fortitude just to be temperate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sit on your hands and don't pick up your phone, you know. <laughs> yeah. oh. um, we have a question from Gina that it's kind of um, to this point um, about how she hears a lot about like resilience in secular contexts. And um, she asks, how is fortitude different from resilience? And does it have to do with the source of the virtue of fortitude? Yeah, great question. So, um, so basically resilience is what I was trying to describe as a psychological attitude of um, in response to potential dangers. So resilience in itself is not a virtue because the shell of the oyster is resilient to external dangers, but that's not a psychologically healthy place to be. Fortitude is when your reason enacts your will to endure an evil or to combat the evil. And so there, that's where you have this sort of psychologically more healthy place where your virtue is then helping you to encounter it as a human being. 
So, so resilience in itself isn't, isn't uh, a virtue, but it can help certain virtues. Right. So if you develop resilience in respect to, say, you know, people who um, bother you, then that can lead to fortitude insofar as now you're not being bothered so much. You can make a choice. I want to endure this for a good purpose, for their good, so I can help them, or at least enduring it for the salvation of souls or something like that. So, again, re resilience in some is the psychological response of not, um, not responding too strongly to exterior dangers, but then fortitude is using your reason and will to direct that to some kind of good. Okay, so is resilience somewhat similar to more classical stoicism where you try not to react so much and be more, I guess, resilient? Yeah, yeah, so, so you can see how there's, um, there's a similarity between philosophical stoicism and what I described as the psychological attitude of the oyster. Um, sometimes though, these psychological attitudes don't result from say the study of a philosopher it's not like it's all people who are harsh and grumpy are so because they, they're convinced that marcus aurelius has some wisdom sometimes this is more of a psychological response to a danger or to some impending evil so so again resilience can be related to stoicism but formally it's distinct okay um, so i think um unfortunately we're all out of time for questions